if that's it. No, it's not. Oh, I know. This here. The Jewish Faction by Joseph Sobrin Part 1 Jews in America are often spoken of as a minority. So they are, in more than a numerical sense, as I will explain. But despite their small numbers, they are also a powerful faction though the term faction is rarely applied to them. In Federalist No. 10, James Madison gave a famous and useful definition of the word. Quote, By a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion, or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens, or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community." Unquote. The organized Jewish faction is what I call the tribe. It's a bit more specific than the Jews, but it includes most Jews, who, as many opinion polls show, overwhelmingly support the state of Israel, and furthermore, overwhelmingly favor progressive causes like legal abortion, sexual freedom, and gay rights. What is striking about the tribe is not that its positions on such matters are necessarily wrong, but that they are anti-Christian. They are even anti-Judaic, in that they contravene the moral code of Moses. Jews today define themselves formally by descent, or, less politely, race, though the term is taboo rather than by religion, and less formally, by antagonism to Christianity. It would be inaccurate to say that the tribe adopts certain social attitudes and political positions even though these are repugnant to most Christians. It adopts them chiefly because they are repugnant to Christians. Within the tribe, one of the worst sins a Jew can commit is to become a Christian, as witness Jewish hostility to Jews for Jesus. An irreligious or atheist Jew may claim Israeli citizenship at any time, but a Jew who has converted to Christianity may not. This antagonism is so predominant that the tribe opposes not only government endorsements of Christianity, but even the public exaltation of the Old Testament, as in displays of the Ten Commandments on public property, because Christians have adopted it too. The Judeo-Christian tradition is a sentimental myth treasured by many Christians, but by very few Jews. The tribe has no pope or authoritative body defining its creed, but its attitudes aren't hard to discern. As Samuel Johnson says, a community must be judged non numero sed pondere, not by numbers, but by weight. And the preponderance of Jewish sentiment is clear. It loathes Christianity 
and Christian influence in public life. It resents Christian proselytizing, one of the first Christian duties virtually banned in Israel. It considers the Gospels the very source of what it calls anti-Semitism. In fact, the very word anti-Semitism is basically a tribal synonym for Christianity. This was all spelled out for even the most naive observer by the fierce tribal reaction to Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ. The barely concealed hatred of Christianity came roaring forth long before the movie was even finished. The columnist Charles Krauthammer spoke for many Jews when he wrote that the story of Christ's passion had, quote, resulted in countless Christian massacres of Jews and prepared Europe for the ultimate massacre. Six million Jews systematically murdered within six years in the heart, alas, of a Christian continent." Unquote. Alas, indeed. That Christianity caused the Holocaust, along with countless other Christian persecutions of Jews for almost two millennia, was a given for Jews commenting on the film. Abraham Foxman of the Anti-Defamation League, along with other Jewish leaders, flatly predicted that Gibson's film would cause hatred and violence against Jews, implying, of course, that Christians are fully capable of such rabid conduct even now though it would be directly contrary to Christian doctrine. William Sapphire of the New York Times virtually blamed the Holocaust on Christ himself, citing the words, quote, I come not to bring peace, but a sword, unquote, as evidence of Christianity's inherent violence. Since the allegations about the past are never more definite than Krauthammer's unspecified countless, would that be more or less than six million? We are dealing here not with genuine historical memory, but with a mythological caricature of Christian history that still obsesses the tribal mind, both shaping and expressing its present feelings. So much for interfaith dialogue. As Rabbi Jacob Neusner has observed, for most Jews today, Auschwitz has replaced Sinai as the definitive moment in the Jewish past. And Auschwitz is projected all the way back to Calvary. It's now a tribal article of faith that until the Second Vatican Council in 1965, the Catholic Church taught that all Jews were Christ killers. This, of course, is false, as older Catholics know firsthand and as anyone else can easily ascertain. The notion that the Church reversed this supposedly ancient teaching displays modern ignorance of the way the Church does business. It assumes that she can arbitrarily make and unmake doctrines, like a contemporary dictator changing the party line overnight. But she acts slowly and deliberately precisely because she can never repudiate a settled teaching while claiming infallibility. Even Catholic children used to grasp that. 
When I joined the church in 1961, the only Jews I knew personally were some quite amiable neighbors. If anyone had told me that the Hellman family down the street bore special responsibility for the crucifixion, I would have been utterly mystified. So bizarre an idea would have been an impediment to my conversion. It simply wouldn't have made sense. And it never occurred to my Catholic mentors. They didn't need a new church council to tell them that it was nonsense. They didn't speak nonsense. It had nothing to do with loving or hating Jews as such. I was far more inclined to hate Protestant heretics at that point, but I never even thought of blaming them for, say, communist persecution of Catholics. It would have been about as rational as blaming Julius Caesar for Pearl Harbor. The tribe, however, embraces the mythical charge of Christ-killing in order to reverse it. Christians are Jew-killers. And it all began, by implication, with Christ himself, whose followers immediately after his death naturally began implementing his principles of charity by persecuting Jews, a course they have persisted in for almost two millennia. Astute readers will sense a discrepancy here. Christians were in no position to persecute anyone for nearly three centuries, until the conversion of Constantine in Anno Domini 313. Meanwhile, they suffered some pretty severe persecution themselves. According to the Acts of the Apostles, it began with the Jews, who rejected Christ and tried furiously to exterminate the infant church. We also know this from the testimony of one of the persecutors themselves, the turncoat Saul of Tarsus, whom we know as St. Paul. Paul himself died as a result of charges brought by the tribe before Roman officials, just as Christ had. The tribe's cohesion and survival over the two succeeding millennia has often seemed miraculous, even to Christians. By a fine irony, the Talmud claims credit for Christ's death beyond what the Church has actually taught. It says that our sages justly condemned him to death as a sorcerer, not even mentioning a Roman role in the event. The Gospel of John merely says that his own received him not and the creeds say that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, passing up golden opportunities to affix tribal guilt at the outset. At any rate, Christians knew from the start how the tribe felt about them, and nothing has changed since then except that today's Christians have become remarkably naive about it. Christ tells us to forgive our enemies, but he doesn't ask us to pretend that they are our friends. He predicted persecution as a natural price of discipleship. Hence, we are to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Christians have often failed on both counts, but the guidelines are clear enough. In fact, 
church officials have often condemned popular Christian outrages against Jews. The worst of which occurred during the Black Death of the 14th century. Not only Christian charity, but worldly common sense could see that the Jews were being victimized by a superstitious fury. A madness brought on by inexplicable calamity. Anyone who concentrates on the tribe risks losing his sense of proportion. This includes, preeminently, the tribe itself. If the history of Christian Europe is the history of persecution of Jews, the first question that naturally arises is why the Jews have chosen to live in Europe for so many centuries. If you were wanted for murder in Detroit, why would you choose to move to Detroit, of all places on earth? Why have Diaspora Jews persistently settled in Christian lands, instead of rushing en masse to their homeland in the Middle East, the Holy Land itself? Next year in Jerusalem? Why? As Dodger fans used to say, wait till next year? May I utter here, in the privacy of my own newsletter, the dark and reactionary suspicion that the perpetually plaintive tribe was actually content to live in Christian lands? Even today, more Jews choose to live in Christian America than in the state of Israel. Typically attacking Christians for supposed bigotries they harbor, instead of thanking Christians for their long record of tolerance and benevolence. Again, the tribe seems, by its own account, to have a long and puzzling tradition of migrating to anti-Semitic countries. Or rather, anti-Semitism is the explanation it gives for its own perpetual unpopularity. And at the root of anti-Semitism, it insists, is Christianity. Though a new explanation has to be found for its unpopularity in the Muslim world. Enough already. It's time to face the possibility that Jewish problems are sometimes due to Jewish attitudes and Jewish behavior. My father once remarked to me that the Jews are disliked everywhere they go because of their crooked ways. Though, as I later learned, Dad had been an altar boy, he said nothing about Christ killing. He'd long since left the church, and he didn't particularly care who had killed Christ. As a matter of fact, he didn't particularly dislike Jews, but he did think it was their ethics, not their biblical record, that had earned them their low reputation. The popular verb, Jew, would seem to bear him out. So do countless ethnic jokes about Jewish sharp dealing and devious conduct. So, in fact, do Talmudic passages authorizing Jews to relieve Gentiles of their property, if they can do it without incurring anger against Jews in general. These are the sorts of things that actually irritate, and sometimes amuse, non-Jews. Has anyone ever heard a joke about Jews killing Christ? End of part one.